tunnel. Dave Filoni just delivered a shot of pure Star Wars straight into our eyeballs, and damn, it felt good. Rosario Dawson's debut as Ahsoka Tano came with a Camtono full of mythology and the apparent confirmation that the producers intend to connect both The Mandalorian and Star Wars Rebels, with Ahsoka still on the hunt for Grand Admiral Thrawn, who was last seen disappearing into hyperspace with Ezra Bridger. Where is Grand Admiral Thrawn? One could make a few aesthetic nitpicks with Ahsoka's live-action transformation compared to how she looked in The Clone Wars and Rebels, but as a fan of the character, it was truly thrilling to see her in the flesh. While Dawson will never be able to recreate Ashley Eckstein's delivery, she easily embodies the grace and gravitas of the character. Her stealthy introduction helped build the tension and emphasize the skill and style of a character who trained under Anakin Skywalker, and has been wielded in the Force for decades at this point. Seeing her two lightsabers ignite through the mist was an evocative image, and Dawson easily sold Ahsoka's creativity in battle, slashing chunks out of trees to throw at her enemies and leaping out of nowhere to strike with deadly accuracy. But it was Ahsoka's quiet moment moments with baby Yoda, whose real name is apparently Grogu, that'll never catch on, that really evoked the best of Star Wars. From Ahsoka's wistful recollection of the Jedi Order's history to the acknowledgement that the bond between Mando and Grogu is unbreakable and potentially harmful as far as Baby Yoda's Jedi training is concerned. We learned that the child was raised in the Jedi Temple on Coruscant but hidden after Order 66, after which his memory becomes conveniently dark. As with all good TV shows, these revelations raise more questions than answers. Did Ahsoka know about Grogu at the Temple? If she has only ever met one other being like Grogu, Master Yoda himself, does that confirm that Grogu is Yoda's son? Rip Yaddle, I guess. Who took Grogu from the temple and hid him for all these years, and how did he end up on Avala 7 and on Moff Gideon's radar? From a character standpoint, it's also interesting that Ahsoka didn't correct Mando or anyone else when they called her a Jedi, given that she left the Order a long time ago. But maybe she didn't want to be pedantic given how few surviving Jedi there are now. We're unlikely to see Luke in the show given the Mandalorian's timeline relative to Mark Hamill's age, but Ezra Bridger, Cal Kestis, and Seer Junda are possibilities. Although, if Ahsoka is specifically hunting Grand Admiral Thrawn, it stands to reason that she may be hoping that if Baby Yoda reaches out through the Force, it may be Ezra who responds to his call. Ahsoka's refusal to train Grogu makes sense in the context of Anakin's fall, and it's also possible that she's sending Mando on a wild goose chase to Tython, knowing that it's unlikely any Jedi will reveal themselves if they've been hidden for so long. The show has already toyed with Baby Yoda struggling with some dark impulses, so it would be interesting if Favreau and Filoni wanted to explore the lore of the dark side with the child. But that seems unlikely given that the kid still can't articulate himself verbally, so he can't exactly throw Anakin-style temper tantrums. Aesthetically, Filoni is paying homage to the samurai films of Kurosawa, another major Star Wars influence in Chapter 13, giving us a break from the Western-inspired desert locales that are the show's bread and butter. But there's still plenty of lone gunslinger imagery here, especially in Mando's showdown with Michael Bane's Lang. And another useful bit of lore is revealed this week. Beskar is resistant to the energy of a lightsaber, which is surely set in the stage for Mando's eventual showdown with Moff Gideon, hopefully with an assist from Ahsoka. And there's still the Chekhov's gun of Gideon's tracking beacon on the Razor Crest, which will no doubt come into play within the next couple of episodes. While well, ultimately this is an episode that's more satisfying for all the seeds it's planting for the future, as well as the payoff of Ahsoka's live-action debut, it's also quintessential Star Wars, firmly rooting the Mandalorian in the larger mythology and paying off several lingering mysteries, all while introducing new ones. It's a thrill ride from beginning to end, one that evokes the childish glee that all the best installments of Star Wars manage to offer. If you want even more on The Mandalorian, then why not check these videos out?